Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship at Stone Church. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning, whether you are here in person or joining us online. Um, I pray that being here in light of all of the heavy events of this past week um, is a place of solace, of being present to our God, and I pray that you will feel the tie that binds us together this day and that you will find some comfort this morning. Um, I do want to uh, point to some announcements. If you look inside your bulletin, um, I'll highlight some of those for you. I encourage you to read through them. Uh, we do have our graduate recognition Sunday next Sunday. Uh, the deadline to submit that information to either myself or Jennifer in the office is Wednesday, June 1st. Um, we'll, we want to recognize your grads. And so if someone related to you, someone that you're proud of that you want to highlight, please send us their information. Uh, next Sunday is also Pentecost Sunday, and so we invite you to wear red or other flame-like colors uh, to worship if you'd like. And also next week is a congregational meeting following the service to elect our elders and deacons and also our pastor nominating committee. Um, a digital copy of the annual report will be uh, submitted and brought out to you this week along with some biographies for everybody. Um, and so look, be on the lookout for that. Um, I also want to highlight that Vacation Church School registration is now open, and you'll notice that the dates are July 11th through 15th, which is a little bit later than we normally have it. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to Mary Jo, and registration forms are here in the office, or you can email her for a digital copy. Um, another thing I'd like to highlight that's not in your bulletin is that just beware, we all know that scammers are out there, but there's a new, new ones going out that are saying it's like from Reverend Evie Mackway, from Irene Packley and asking for gift cards or money to, you know, for some special cause. Please, if you ever get an email, none of us pastors will ever ask you individually for money. That's not what we do. Um, and so please don't respond to that. And if you get an unusual email, please also let us know so that we can figure out what's going on. Um, but I do want to alert you to that because that's been happening a little bit. Also text messages. If you get a text message that says it's from either one of us asking for money, please do not respond. Friends, I also share the heavy news that um, our beloved Hazel James uh, passed away on Friday uh, with her daughters by her side, Sherry and Susie. And so we uh, continue to keep Sherry and Susie in our prayers. Um, I know that this is a heavy loss for our community, and we will keep you informed of a memorial service and let you know when that will be. Um, in life and in death, we belong to God and we give thanks for the life of Hazel James. Um, friends, I would like to invite now Meredith forward to share a little bit about the Pentecost offering that's coming up. Good morning. From the day they are born and even before they are born, we are busy making plans for our children. Some of our planning is about the really big things, like the name they will carry or finding the college that will help them fulfill their dreams. Some of our planning is much smaller, like what they will wear on their first day of school or what we're gonna make them for dinner. The truth is, whether it's something big or small, our lives are consumed with making plans for our children. But we aren't the only ones. No matter how much time we spend making plans, doing our very best for our children every day, we can never truly know what God's plan is for them or us. I think it is very possible, in fact, I believe with my whole heart, I trust with my whole heart, that God is planning so much more than we can ever imagine. As it states in Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to give you a future with hope. Yes, hope. Our plans need to include helping our young people build a life grounded in faith that will last a lifetime and will allow them to come to know the God in, of hopeful futures, to inspire them to share their faith, ideas, and unique gifts with the church and the world, and in doing so, bring hope to others. So at Pentecost, we celebrate that God offers more than we can plan, our gifts to the Pentecost offering connect with God's hope and future by supporting ministries with children. So on Pentecost Sunday, June 5th, our offering um, will help the church encourage 
develop and support its young people. 40% of the Pentecost offering will be retained by our individual congregation. And this year, Stoneworks has asked the Stone Church youth to make the choice on where that 40% goes to a local community. So I'm really excited to see who they choose to support. And the remaining 60% is used to support ministries in the Presbyterian Mission Agency, such as the Young Adult Volunteer Program, Presbyterian Youth and Triennium Office, uh, the Educate a Child, Transform the World Initiative, um, and others. So please give generously because when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us hear your plan, God of peace. May your hope find willing hands and hearts as we tend to the youngest among us, building a life of faith. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. We are being called to worship with a responsive reading. We want to be here. We need to be here. We choose to be here. We are called to be here. Trusting in that promise today, let us worship God together. God is a God of justice and love, waiting to be gracious to us, yearning to have compassion on us. Therefore, in faith, let us join our hearts in confession to God together. Forgive us, O God, forgive us, for it is hard for us to say who you are when it requires us to be honest about ourselves. It is hard for us to say who you are when we've seen your beauty and not pause to praise it. 
It is hard for us to say who you are when we've scoffed at brokenness and not recognized we created it. It is hard for us to say who you are when it requires us to confess that we know something of your love but fail to live like it. It is hard for us to say who you are when we are heartbroken. Forgive us, O Christ, and help us to turn toward you, recognizing the ways in which your goodness and mercy pour upon us every day, again and again. This is the good news of the gospel, and it is for you and for all. Whoever, whatever you have done, whatever you have failed to do, whoever you are, whoever you wish you were, but are not, you are accepted and you are welcomed. In the love of Jesus Christ, we are set free to let go of what is old and broken, to live a new life in the resurrection, and to follow together a joyful way after Jesus Christ, our Savior. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, having been assured of new life together, let us share that with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace, everyone. Hi, Marge. Peace of Christ. Hi, Tab. Peace of Christ. Hi, Stephanie. Peace. Hi, Bruce. Peace of Christ. What's up, Tab? Peace. Hey, Carol and Jim, how are you? Good morning. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ. Peace Our first lesson is found in the book of John, chapter 17, verses 1 to 11. If you want to follow along in a pew Bible, it's on page 111 in the New Testament. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do, so now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. And the second reading is a psalm. 
Psalm 13, found on page 494 of the Old Testament. I wanted to note that this is a psalm of lament, and it seems terribly appropriate for this week. But then I want you to notice that at the end of the psalm, the last two verses turn, pivot, toward a positive affirmation. Hold that in your hearts. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes shall rejoice, because I am shaken. And now here we go. But I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen.
I saw a couple of my guys out there. Come on down. <laughs> Come on down. Oh, it's so great to see you. How many more times? I don't know, but I am glad that it's you guys. I'm glad you're here because you're the best. First of all, so I have to ask all of you out there and you guys, is anyone here afraid of snakes? Snakes. I love snakes. Well, yeah, we're not afraid of snakes, are you? How about the dark? The dark, yeah. How about uh, during a rain, a thunderstorm, which I wish we'd have more of them? I mean, I don't know that sun. Well, the fact is that all of us are afraid about something. Even the rich and famous have their fears. Let me tell you about a couple of them. You've probably heard of Johnny Depp, especially lately. But he's the star of the Pirates of the Caribbean. But you might be surprised to know that a sight of a clown makes this brave pirate shake in his boots. He's afraid of clowns. And how many people here fear insects and little creepy crawly things? Yeah, I see some hands up there. Um, and one of them's your mom. So you have to kill all the spiders in their house. Yeah. Do, if they do, well, you're not alone. Actor Scarlett Johansson is afraid of cockroaches. Nicole Kidman can't stand butterflies. And singer Justin Timberlake is afraid of spiders. So we all have things in our lives that we're frightened about. And myself, I'm going to confess something else. That you guys are going to learn about me. I am afraid to write on a chalkboard or a whiteboard. That's my fear. It may seem funny to many of you, but it's a traumatic experience. It was when I was young. And I went to go write. The teacher asked me to go to the board, which I did, and write something, which I did. But I misspelled a word. So that teacher, instead of making it easy for me and not so embarrassing, made me stand up there until I found the correct spelling on my own. Which probably thought, she probably thought she was doing a great job. But a bit I'm 70 and I'm still traumatically, uh, you know, I can't write on the board. I can write on a piece of paper. And then I go to put the chalk up like this. <laughs> may seem silly to you, but it's really real to me. So if you have any fears or sadness, that's really real to you. So what should you do? So whenever I worry, I worry, I think of uh, the words of Mr. Rogers. And you guys know who Mr. Rogers is, right? Daniel Tiger? Yeah, he's the best. Um, you know, he was great. It was a great show he had, but Mr. Rogers had the special skill of helping children understand the feelings, that all feelings are natural, good and bad, and that it's part of being a human being. He encouraged us to talk about our feelings so that we could manage them. And when he was a child, his, and he got very scared, his mother told him, look for the helpers. They will always be helpers. You know, when I'm having a traumatic experience writing on the board, you notice that I say, who wants to write on the board? Yeah, see? And everyone answers, picks up. That's how I manage my fear, because I know there's always a kid who wants to write on the bulletin board, or on the on chalkboard. So always remember that there are helpers and people who love you, people at the church, people in your household, people at your school. There's always your friends. There's always a helper. Jesus always prom also promised to help us when we are afraid. Everyone is afraid of something. But we should not let our fears interfere with living our best life. After all, he promised he would help us when we are afraid. So let us pray. Dearest Lord, Mother, Father, when we are afraid or sad, Help us to look for your strength. We know that you love us and want us to be safe. Thank you for the mentors like Mr. Rogers, Irene, our minister Irene, and many others who care for us that remind us that our feelings matter. And all God's children said, Amen. Our third reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1 starting at verse 6. Listen again for God's word for us this morning. When Jesus and the disciples had come together, they asked Jesus, 
Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O God, our creator, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, we first want to acknowledge again that you are God and we are not. Who you are and your movement in this world is many times beyond our comprehension. But we are here with faith, seeking understanding. And so we come before your word this morning seeking some kind of solace within it, even as we honestly ask, how long, O God? And so continue to reveal yourself to us as we open our hearts and minds to your spirit. May your comfort enter in. And if not right now, help us to trust that it will. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This past Tuesday morning, on May 24th, I woke up as I do every morning to the sound of both of my children squealing and talking to each other while climbing up on our bed and then jumping and playing around us as I tried to sneak in a few more minutes of sleep. So far, getting those few extra minutes has never been successful, but you have to credit me for trying every day. We got the kids ready for school, and Marion dropped off Eden at daycare, and I had a a leisurely breakfast and morning with Ezra before our regular Tuesday staff meeting. I was chatting with Pastor Evie about the week ahead, and then our office manager, Jennifer, interrupted our meeting to let us know that she got a phone call from Sherry that her mother... Our beloved 98-year-old and longtime member of Stone Church, Hazel James, was in the hospital and that death might be imminent. Both daughters were on their way, but uh, that it might be a while before they got there because both of them were out of town for different reasons. And so, of course, Evie and I put that meeting on pause, and I immediately drove over to Good Sam to be with Hazel. She did not die that day. Instead, I was able to spend about six hours chatting with her, learning even more about her life, reciting scripture together, and singing some of her favorite hymns. Both daughters were able to get there and be with her. Um, Grandchildren were calling her. Great-grandchildren were calling her. Only love filled that room. And then Hazel herself told me to go home because I'd been there a really long time and that I should go home and be with my kids. As soon as I got to my car, I saw all the news alerts on my phone indicating what would end up being the tragic news of 19 children murdered, along with two teachers, by yet another mass shooting in Uvalde, Texas, at Robb Elementary School. I moved from a space that was incredibly holy to a space that felt like hell. I could barely absorb what I was reading, but I knew I needed to take Hazel's advice and go home and be with my kids. 
I called Marion and I told him to keep Eden up a little bit longer as it was almost her bedtime because I just needed to hold both of my children. And so I'm sure many of you joined me this week in the waves of grief, of anger, of feeling overwhelmed. And I know I was not the only one holding my children close that night and in the days to come while weeping for those who would no longer be able to do so. It was supposed to just be a normal Tuesday. I would end up going back every day to see Hazel as she was put into hospice care. And as many of you know, by Friday, she took her last breath with her daughters by her side. Every moment I got with Hazel and her family this week, it all felt holy, all the way to the end. And at some point in the week, I was sharing this juxtaposition of the tragedy of the shooting and the holy of being with Hazel. And Mary Jo said to me, Irene, there's death, and then there's death. There's death, and then there's death. And it took me a second to absorb what she was saying, but she's right. There is death that can be holy, and there is death that is hell. And I experienced both this week, and I won't lie, it was a lot. The disciples in our scripture reading today also understood grief and the multifaceted feelings that come with death. Because only about 40 days prior, they had lost their beloved friend, their teacher, and their leader to a humiliating and tragic death on a cross. Each of them experienced different things probably ranging from guilt, shame, and deep sorrow, wishing they had said or done things differently. And then three days later, they found an empty tomb, and Jesus would appear to them saying, Peace be with you, and showed them his hands and his side and came back to them. And so then you can imagine their reticence to ever let him out of their sight and their eagerness to know all the things. They were still waiting for the grand act of salvation by Jesus, freedom from their oppressors, justice and liberation from a corrupt empire. I mean, this is why he came back, right? To make things right. And so the disciples are understandably eager to know, when will be the time, Jesus, when you will restore all things? Is it now? Is this the time? What's happening? When? When are you going to act in the ways in which we expect you to act? Friends, in light of the tragic events of the past couple of weeks, and especially this past week, I am sure we all find ourselves wanting to ask that question as well. Jesus, when will you restore all things? Is it now? Is this the time? What is happening when we want answers? We want action. And then Jesus tells them and is telling us again that the time piece is not for us to know. But, but he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus promises us that come what may, we will not be alone, will not do it alone, but that we will receive a spirit that will allow us the ability to continue the next phase of his ministry as witnesses right where we are. And you know, if that had been all that had happened, maybe the disciples would have actually heard it, absorbed it, and been encouraged. Instead, what happens next distracts them from the promise they have just heard. Scripture says, when Jesus had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. You all, what? Now, friends, I'm not going into a a theological discussion in a sermon about the legitimacy of the ascension, And I know I'm taking a chance even preaching it today because most preachers will usually skip this part of the story. 
But what I will say about the ascension is that although we cannot know the time when all things will be restored, this story does look forward in time. I read that it is the departure that makes it possible, that makes possible this next new phase of ministry where the Spirit will come and the ministry will move from the embodied Christ to each of his disciples, to each one of us. And the Pentecost story is yet to come. Stay tuned. Next week, everyone. But waiting is hard. And grief is hard. And I'm sure it was unbelievable that just as quickly as he had returned to them, he was gone again. No wonder they stood there staring up at the sky. They would then return back to the upper room, enclosing themselves again, this time not necessarily in fear, but in prayer, and probably a lot of confusion and wondering what to do next as they waited. Um, A pastor friend of mine told the story of a seventh grader in her youth group who reflected on this part of the story, saying, quote, I mean, to see Jesus die on the cross, come back, and then just randomly go into heaven, that must have been hard for the disciples. If I were one of the disciples at that time, I would have felt as though Jesus was playing tricks with me the whole time. And to be honest, I would have probably felt like he abandoned me. Friends, throughout our own lives of faith, I am sure that each one of us have also felt this feeling of God abandoning us. The parents and families who were waiting to hear or see whether their child was alive at Robb Elementary School on Tuesday and coming home to unimaginable loss and grief. Like those early disciples might have been left looking up toward the sky in their darkest moment, asking, Where in the world are you, God? Why have you abandoned me? And I'll be the first to confess that I do not know how much faith I would or could have in that moment. And yet, in the ascension, In the distraction of a man being lifted into the sky, we quickly forget that his promises, that he promises that we will not be left abandoned and alone and hopeless. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses. There is a promise that is coming, but stay tuned for but staying tuned for what is next is hard. But it doesn't change the fact that the promise of the Holy Spirit is coming. A comforter, a presence to abide with us, to help us make God in Christ known to us in the depths of our despair, and the one who gives us the words to pray when we do not have any more words. Now, I know I said to stay tuned for Pentecost next week, but church... For those of you who need some kind of hope today, here's what I was reminded of this past week with my own back and forth of death that felt holy and death that felt like hell. And that is that the Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit has already been given to each one of us. That promise is here. And nowhere does Jesus tell us that having the gift of the Spirit will make us unafraid or superhuman or suddenly all faithful. But he does say it will give us power to witness to those around us. We just have to trust it. Elise Myers, a funny and honest social media personality, said this week in one of her posts, When I'm asked how I manage my nerves... I say, I don't. I don't. I just do things scared. I just do things scared. And you know, this resonated with me deeply because I think a lot of times when we are called into action for something we care about or when we want to share something important or speak truth to power, a lot of times we are afraid. We are afraid we're going to say the wrong things, that we will offend someone, that someone might not like us anymore or reject us. 
A lot of times we do not feel ready when we are called upon to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. We look at those who are doing these things, and they seem so unafraid. But friends, I think the truth is they probably are afraid and just do things scared. And so I really appreciated that simple post because she's naming that very few of us manage our nerves before or in order to do the right thing or to say the right thing. Most of the time when we are called into a specific moment to do what is right, we are afraid and we do things scared. This ascension story is where Jesus passes his great work to all of us. It's when Jesus shares that although he will not be physically present, that this work of ministry will continue in and through each one of us. And you know what? Those disciples were not 100% ready. I can guarantee that. But they would do it because they trusted the spirit that would give them the power to be those witnesses. And as a result of their faithful witness, we are all sitting here today seeking to continue to know what it means to be faithful witnesses for our time, here and now. As Hazel entered into hospice care and became weak weaker, in one of my final visits with her where she could still speak a little bit, she turned to me and simply said, pray. Now listen, up to that point, I had said several prayers with her, but knowing that this might be the last time that she could make that request of me, I immediately felt insecure about my ability to say the right and comforting things that she might need to hear in a prayer. And so I took a deep breath, paused for a second, and I did it scared. And honestly, I have no idea what came out of my mouth and my heart. But when I was done, her body told me that it brought her the comfort that she needed. And for the last time, we said, Amen, together. Church, the Spirit is already here. Today, may you not be distracted by what you cannot comprehend and stand only looking to the sky. Instead, may what we do in here fill the streets out and the world out there Go and look for the helpers. Be the witness that Christ is calling you to be because of your faith, not in spite of it. And when someone asks you how you manage your nerves to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly, even in the face of the world's grief, tell them the truth that you usually don't. You just do things scared. You do things scared because you hold the promise that you will never be alone, and you are held by the presence of an almighty, merciful, and all-loving God. May you believe that again this day. So let the church say together, Amen. God has shown us the meaning of generosity in the diversity of creation and in never-ending love, a gift of the Holy Spirit. We are called to be a community that shares God's blessings with our talents, our affections, and our material goods. Let us now share our gifts as we present our morning offering with joy and thanksgiving.
Our gracious God, we are gathered here in this community where we have shared deep sorrow, where we have also shared comfort one with another, giving and taking. We give thanks for this community. And in this moment, we bring our gifts in thanksgiving, in support of that community. In Christ's name, amen. How's this? There we got it. Good. Thank you. As we come to this time of prayer, three times during this, the prayers, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and I ask your response to be, hear our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Fine. And then during the time of intercessions, I'll pause, and it'll be an opportunity for you to raise for yourself the particular blessings you ask for some people. You may either do that vocally or you can just uh, pray silently, but there will be a time for you to offer your intercessions. Let us, praise, let us worship God. Gracious God, the world is your creation and all of us live by your faithfulness. On this holiday weekend, we offer our thanksgiving for the many skills, talents, and commitments that you have given and confirmed in us. For minds that can think, for hearts that can feel, for hands and feet that accomplish much, we thank you. For purposes and causes that inspire us, for labor that fulfills us, for tasks and commitments that have been completed, we thank you. For families and friends who have supported and nurtured us, the gifts of grace that restore us and forgive us, we thank you. Creator God, as the seasons move on, with spring now offering the promises of new life, you have created us to mirror your creativity in our work and in our care for each other. Receive our gratitude and strengthen us with your spirit. We offer thanksgiving for the lives of generations past who fought and sacrificed for our communities and nation. May we also live that we give honor to their sacrifices. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of the nations, as we turn to view the world around us, we are dismayed by the conflicts between persons and communities, and that answers are so difficult to reach. As wars and conflict continue, we, cities, we see cities destroyed and wonder if there is a point to the carnage. We mourn the deaths of children and their teachers in Texas and wonder how to prevent future similar incidents. We insist that answers are within our grasp and pray for leadership to draw us together in reasonable conversation to take steps toward healing. We ask for the grace of your Holy Spirit to move among us, that discourse not become demeaning and demissive, but rather that we may move toward answers with compassion and understanding of each other. Help us to prevent discussion from becoming invective. Help us to honor such each other's opinion, even if we are opposed to that similar position. We cannot resolve our differences without your presence, and we seek your grace now. We live in troubling times, holy God, and seek ways to build more con considerate and affirming communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God of compassion, we continue our prayers as we lift to you the members of this community. We pray for the families of Hazel James and Henry Malacone, and all families who today feel the pains of grief. Give them hope and strength for the future. We seek your mercy for folks in long-term illnesses. We pray for Carl and Dar, for Elaine, for Pam, and for Karen. We pray for Donald and Roberto and Walter, and all who this day live in long-term care. Hear us now as we lift to you those for whom we ask your particular grace and blessings. Good. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. All these prayers we offer to you, for you have taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as our charge for today, receive this reading from the Talmud. Do not, do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And so go, friends. Do things scared. And may you find that the Spirit is already with you, enabling you to do what you are called to do for such a time as this. Do things scared. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the continued fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>